Hello, everybody, and welcome again to the next in our editions of IBTM Meets. My name is Shane Hannam, the Portfolio Director for IBTM Events, and I am delighted to be here today with Neil Brownlee, who is the head of uh, head of business events, sorry, for Visit Scotland. Neil, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for taking the time, and it'll be great over the next few minutes to to get to know you a bit more. Thanks, Shane. Delighted to be here and delighted to be speaking ultimately to all our IBTM friends who we miss so much. Definitely. Well, we certainly look forward to catching up in December. So um, that's all, all going ahead and, and, and planned as we would like it to be. So um, that's all very good. So as you know, Neil, um, today really is just uh, a little bit of an informal chat, trying to understand a bit more about your journey through the business events industry and how you got to where you are today. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a bit about the destination and some of the things that are going on at Visit Scotland. Um, so if it's okay with you, I will kick off with the first question. Please do. Great. So tell us a little bit, Neil, please, about how you got into the world of business events um, and the route to your current role as, as heading that up for Visit Scotland. Sure. Well, I think like most of your viewers, uh, my route to business events perhaps wasn't intended and it, it evolved over time. Um, to go right back, I was a graduate in hotel management that was a thing to do hotel and catering management to become a general manager through the food and beverage route okay. uh, but fast forward yield management and revenue management came on so my background was hotels luxury hotels in scotland and england but also in north america for meridian um, i did the revenue management and then i became a director of sales at the balmoral hotel in edinburgh and after that i moved on to sodexo the, the and it was a luxury arm of the, the catering giant uh, dealing with all the Really the high-end properties in Scotland that would service what I would then know as the incentive clients. Uh, and then the job came up in Visit Scotland um, as a meetings and incentives manager. And uh, within two years, I was head of business events. And I've been in the hot seat ever since. So I think like a lot of people, um, I was aware of incentives and associations and you know, from my hotel days. I understand what they are. Um, but my route into this particular seat, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not linear, but it, it, it makes sense when I look back on it. Uh, but there's certainly a few fortuitous moments. Um, and I think of all the people back at university who did hotel and catering management, I think I am the only one who is sort of in tourism. And of course, whether or not we are part of tourism in business events <laughs> is what is, is one of the big philosophical debates. Um, of course. Uh, so that's my journey. My back is basically hotel school, luxury hotels, catering company, revenue management, national tourism organization. That's how I got here. And as ever, being the uh, the business events dedicated bit of the national tourism organization, um, as I know a lot of my counterparts around Europe have the same thing. We are delighted to be part of the NTO. Uh, but sometimes you can be competing for, for attention and perhaps a sort of understanding of what what we do and why it's slightly different. Sure. Uh, that's always, I think, you know, the dialogue on that is, um, I think it's getting louder and louder, which is great. Um, but, I, you know, there's probably still a long way to go, isn't there? So it's it's an interesting fact in, in terms of how we work together, but remain distinctive, I suppose. Yes, we don't want to be so contrary that we they end up saying right well good riddance to you go and work in government but there's almost there's a very fine balance of um wanting the cloud and the marketing firepower of the nto but as long as we can hone hone the distinct requirements of the business events the sophisticated good looking business events market definitely great and i suppose in terms of that it's a really interesting story neil and i think you know, certainly um, a lot of us come across this industry maybe not so intently or certainly, you know, those of us who have um, been in the industry a while, should we say, um, you know, have, have sort of stumbled across it in some ways. And, and I think part of the appeal of this industry is that those that, you know, like myself, that stumble across it as well, you know, basically you, you fall in love with it and you find it very, very hard to, to leave. So, you know, from your perspective, what is it that sparked that passion for events? Yes, no, I think you're absolutely right. We do love it. I do love what I do. I, I love the industry so much, um, but it has changed in terms of what I thought it was. And perhaps I speak for others. So 
I look back to what I was doing 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and um, it, the, it, there have been a few moments. I think the first time I went to PCMA convening leaders back in 2010 or 11, and it was in Las Vegas. So that was two firsts. Um, I thought, oh, well, there's something that's more to this and meets the eye. And I think also the uh, I've had the same job title for 10 years, but I know my job has changed, you know, about three times. And it, it is absolutely the evolution of, of the role. And to be honest, an evolution of my own understanding of what the job is. So I, I quake to think about what I might have been saying or doing, you know, 10 years ago, which I now realize you know, that that was really low level a low level understanding of what business events was or could be where I was still very much in the, the mindset of the, of the how, which is how a lot of destinations were selling business events or their destinations is how can my event work in Scotland or other countries. Whereas you know, really from a, about eight or nine years ago, as I've developed, it's, it's become very much more about the why. So the why Scotland uh, or why any destination, and I think it has been things like PCMA, the PCMA family, which I think I'm not saying this just because I'm on the board of PCMA, but they're at the forefront of trying to really push the understanding globally of business events. Also, ICA has got a very key role to that and organizations like IBTM and, and your counterparts. It really feels part of a family, but I think we're also all putting the same direction, trying to get greater understanding of what we can do. So for me, the last 10 years have been, you know, every two years, you know, my, my love of the industry gets deeper and deeper, but with that comes frustrations. And sure. you know, all shared by nearly all of your viewers uh, about our inability to get the point across. And I think yeah. this crisis has shown that there's more work to do than ever. Yes, I think you're absolutely right in that regard. I think it's the dial has changed, the dial has, you know, has shifted and, and things have changed, definitely. Um, but I think uh, this has certainly, um, you know, in some countries better than others and more so than others. Um, but I, I think it's it's bringing things hopefully a bit closer to the attention of uh, policymakers and, and governments um, and how important that, that business events element is to, you know, their economies, their destinations and indeed their strategies. Right. So, you know, hopefully, um, if there's anything um, positive to come out of a crisis like this, it will be that the voice yes. gets louder or at least we know how to try and augment that volume yes. um, and, and, and get the message across for our industry. One story I can tell you from that period of you know, 2008, 2009 was you know, getting to know some of the bigger players in the convention centres in Scotland, you know, which the big hotels wouldn't have a huge dealing with no. so it would be the EICC the SEC and um, I remember asking Ben Hudgeburu a name well known he was then of director course. of sales at the SECC as it was then known and he was very patient with me but I remember asking him if, if his venue would be coming to square meal um, which was very much a sort of hands-on here's bits to add to your event type thing you know pop-up bars lighting so and Ben said, no, no, we're, we're associations, so it's not what I'm interested. And the fact that I didn't re understand that distinction maybe two or three years in is pretty terrifying. But as I say, <laughs> he, was, he, he was patient. He's still a very important, you know, person in my, my career in terms of pushing me and, and guiding me um, back then. Um, but that's the sort of change in knowledge, whereas now you know, that's so far down, you know, the logistics end of what we do. Sure. No disrespect to Square Meal. Um, and I know it's important for the incentive market, but the for the associations market, the um, all the academic connections, it, it's a different planet. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think that's right. Is that's a, it's a real shift in the paradigm of where we're at with you know the messaging, the strategy, and also you know you, you talk about um, you know links with the convention centres and 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 all of the partners. That's become ever more important, hasn't it? That collaboration between the entire supply chain yes. from the very moment in, in creating the strategy, let alone, you know, the bid cycle and, you know, and working through how, how the destination is, you know, planning to attract those events. It's, it's much more integral now at an earlier stage, isn't it? Yes, very much so. Uh, it's, it's at the moment we're adding a Scottish context. And I think uh, in terms of our support for the industry in Scotland, that, that too has evolved from, Providing a platform, platforms literally, you know, taking space at IBTM, saying, right, we're taking a visit to Scotland stand. Who wants to come? 
um, or putting together some clients in London or elsewhere who might come out to, to meet people with Visit Scotland, but don't want, you know, a hundred hotel groups all wanted to come to their visit, their offices to visit. So we, sure. we were doing that sort of client interaction. That's still very important. But now we have moved much more to still offering the platforms, which we hope to be able to offer as long as the clients want them and as long as our partners want them, um, but to adding an actual Scottish context um, to, to, to the city level offering, which is which are very strong in Scotland. Definitely. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe changing tack slightly now, Neil. Um, we've heard a lot about Scotland's policy driven model and how effective this strategy is and continues to be. Um, but maybe if you could summarise it for those people in our audience that maybe haven't heard about it, what are the sort of key characteristics that, that makes it unique and, and makes it work really well for, for you guys as the destination? Yeah, well, the, the policy driven model, I think, is a possibly a, a variant of what a lot of destinations are doing. Um, but we hopefully taken it to a different level and came up with a name for it. Um, the, the principle is that every single business event, certainly in the association sector, is clearly aligned to academic expertise or some area. Uh, but that area is also going to be reflected in Scotland's ambitions. So instead of running around looking at different sectors uh, within that perhaps your inward investment agencies might be pursuing, we were convinced there was another level at which we could um, approach this and we realized there was something in Scotland called the National Performance Framework and these are all perhaps 15 or 20 very broad brush things about making the place a better um, country for young people everyone has a fair start um, including all the sustainability arguments uh, transportation arguments a very broad brush but underpinning that were about a hundred different national performance indicators and things like improving child obesity, mental health, transportation issues. And it became clear to us that for every single one of those performance indicators, literally we could find an association congress that we could attract to Scotland over the next 10 years. And I came up with a new expression just a couple of weeks ago that, that we're using to the Scottish government. These are policy platforms. So they can use these as platforms to deliver their policy. So instead of linking in just to sectors, as I said, we're anchoring our entire business events strategy, if you like, into the top of the cliff face, and that's into Scotland's ambitions, not Scotland's tourism industry, sure. not the individual city's ambitions, but the actual ambitions of Scotland as a nation, which hopefully are politics proof that no administration is going to come in and say, we're, we're, we're don't care about child health or infant mental health or, or old people, certainly not now. And um, <laughs> and um, what we also have added seamlessly are the, are the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that sit above that. So there's a lot of moving parts, but like a lot of things we do, that it's, it's a sounds quite a complicated scenario, but it means that we can fundamentally deliver the Scottish government's policy priorities using business events as stepping stones at a UK level, European level, global level for the next 10 years. And the idea is that the Scottish government directorates, so it's not the Scottish government tourism directorate, it's the other 39, like energy or education, um, life sciences, the chief medical officer, all these people, those are the ones who we are engaging with. And those are the ones saying, we want to go after this, 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 and this. And we'll say, well, that won't fit, or that's owned by another country, um, but this is what we can do. And the key thing is um, our cities, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, and Aberdeen, they have their own policy priorities, which is correct, but they're not going to be a million miles away from the Scottish government ones. They're just going to be city specific. So we can align them too, because the, the cities own their selling and their priorities. Um, so, the opportunity is is literally infinite. Uh, a very casual interrogation of the ICA database you know, two years ago told us there's there's twelve and a half thousand peripatetic association congresses moving around yeah. Europe every year that um, physically would fit into Scotland. 
Now, that's not very scientific. You know, 12,500 is a big target list. That would keep us busy to the end of the century. So that's where you need your government to come in and say with us, well, this is what we think we can win. What do you want us to win? And the beauty of it, which remains to be slightly tested, is where there is a hosting fee or especially if it's perhaps not a completely not-for-profit um, organization where there is a right, a hosting fee, which as we know in the world of sports and cultural events, a rights fee is very common. It's just a no-brainer. It's almost expected. Um, so it's, it's get that understanding across with government directorates that if there is a rights fee or a hosting fee, the, the beneficiary directorate, whether it's life sciences or education, uh, they need to come up with the money. It's not coming out of tourism funding. Because it's not a tourism event. It's not tourism activity. It's a showcase of what Scotland is trying to do in pick whatever you want, policy area. So that, in a nutshell, is, is what the policy-driven model is. I think nearly all the destinations um, viewing this in due course will say, yeah, well, we're doing that as well. But I think part of the reason we've come up with a label, um, and the label was something that I came up with with our chief executive, Malcolm Roughhead. He said, well, the old model was a tourism, traditional tourism model. So this is a positive model. I thought, yeah, that, that'll do. Um, and it's being able to make a distinction between what we were doing. So going back to 10 years ago when I started yeah. off thinking I knew what business events were, um, that was the traditional tourism model. Whereas now, and I think this is the only way that business events will progress, is, is where we make clear that we're, the value proposition is much, much loftier and higher. And it will sound lofty and it will sound potentially quite quite pompous because a lot of people are running around doing sporting and cultural events that everyone can go to. You and I can buy a ticket for them. Sure. Whereas the superstars in the business events world, they exist, the academics, the, the particular people who attract congresses. And um, if we can't join this all up as an industry on the back of the COVID crisis, then yeah, potentially we don't deserve to exist. <laughs> no, that, that, I think that's very true. And I think that's there, there's a few interesting and pertinent points in that. And thank you for sharing, Neil. That's a really, you know, it, it is in a nutshell, but it's, it's some great detail in there that hopefully our, all of our viewers will find really insightful. But I think you're right. It's it's about, I suppose, your role is is linking the industry um, to, yeah. to central government and to policy. Um, and, you know, it's very clear that that is a very robust and, and neatly crafted model. Um, it's good that it's politically agnostic, hopefully, um, okay. as well, um, because I think that that really is a real transformation in, like you say, 10 years ago in business events versus now. Many destinations are doing it. I think it's probably fair to say some are a little further on the journey uh, okay. than others. Um, but I think, you know, certainly we talked some about some of our global associations, you know, the, these voices all combined are really what will help drive, you know, the industry forward and drive that messaging. And if we are having that dialogue, as I know you guys are, um, certainly from our policy forum at um, IBTM last year, you know, I think that can only help. Um, and, and, and we certainly feel the same way that that really is the most clear way forward for, for the business events industry. Yeah, and I think the IBTM Policy Forum is excellent and we came away with some ideas to add to our, our own policy-driven model, um, which, you know, again, other people have been thinking at at different levels. But the other facet of this, and it's not just about job preservation or making sure there's a business event specialisation uh, within Scotland, it's, it's getting stakeholders in your home country uh, within the development agencies or local or national government yes. that when when clients go to ibtm or the other shows they want to meet people like me or rory or richard or lindsay people who can speak the language and are fluent in the business events requirement they don't Absolutely. want to meet somebody who's going to speak to them about opening an office or building a factory yeah it's, it's connected but it's it's way down the line and it's it's making it clear that there's a specialization here that has value um, and it's not something that anyone can do um, and I think that's the other reason that everyone are in our organization you know, in Europe and globally that the business events family it is that slightly slight seize mentality that we, we like hanging out because we all understand each other and what we're trying to do 
Um, and it's trying to make that connection that we're not coming up with these brilliant ideas, which are low hanging fruit for governments. These, these are not tens of millions of pounds per event. You're lucky if most of them are a couple of hundred grand at the, at the upper limit. But we're not saying here's something that anyone can do. We're saying here's something we are experts at. And there's people doing my job in, around Europe and around the world. All my peers are doing the same thing. But you couldn't have someone, a random jack of all trades in government or the development agency doing it. It has to be specific. Yeah. A focused discussion at the outset. Um, and then, of course, if that, you know, that first hurdle is, is secured, then, of course, people can then broaden the dialogue. And then, you know, that's when the role of the government and the wider government and the RDA, as you say, you know, yeah. that's when it all begins to, to come together. Yeah, we need, we need their sectoral expertise, but that come that comes later and, and as we all know the associations market especially is very unforgiving if, if you sit down in front of an associations person you know that they know within 10 seconds if you know what you're talking about absolutely which yes. is why i usually let my colleagues handle this <laughs> i'm sure that's not true that's uh, that's very good neil thank you for sharing that that's really really good i think you know that also probably speaks as well as as to how visit scotland supports the industry in in a different way maybe than um what we probably a few years ago would, would have referred to as destination marketing effectively so you know i think that's you know that's something that is um it is very, very clear in, in all the interactions I have with, with you and your guys. It's yeah. definitely clear that there's a very distinct difference in the way that it's approached. So congratulations yeah. on that. It'll be good to see how it, it, it um, continues to evolve. Um, that's really, really good. Thank you for sharing, Neil. I, well, um, the most important relationship we have in Scotland is with our cities, our city convention bureaus and our main comprehension centres because they lead on the selling yes. of their cities. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of having strong convention bureaus. And it's critical that what we do, and our chief executive, Malcolm Raphael, has always been absolutely nuts about this. We have to add value. So whatever the cities and the venues and some of the wonderful resort hotels, Glen Eagles, Turnberry, Fairmont, St. Andrews, the, the lovely incentive five-star destination hotels in Edinburgh, for example, they're all doing brilliant work. There, a lot of them are part of multinationals. They're worth billions. Yeah, that's probably not the right thing to say at the moment, but they have their own sales and marketing global teams. So Visit Scotland has to add value. And what we're doing in the cities at the moment is, you know, they can take it so far, they don't always need our help, but sometimes the client just wants to know that Scotland wants it, not just the city. So we can bring Scottish context, whether that is a letter from a minister or a letter from Nicola Sturgeon, our first minister, um, or even just some nice high resolution videos and images to go with the bid that's the sort of thing that we can do as part of the nto um and it's and it's working in tandem um and it's, it's critical you can do that in a smaller country yeah i mean there's no reason that everybody shouldn't be doing that right there's, there's certainly yeah. it's it's feasible and as you say it's about adding the value and and everyone you know coming together with their own area of expertise but it needs to be pulled together as well yes um, and, and that's very important. Great. Okay. Um, so maybe just one more final question, Neil. What What do you see as maybe some of the key opportunities maybe inside of this um, going forward for Scotland as a destination? Yeah, well, I think um, with, in relation to COVID or just generally? Just generally now. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, we, we've Hopefully, we're coming through COVID um, yeah. uh, in in a positive way, and we're we're moving to to the future. So, probably a more generic future based question. Yeah, I think uh, for Scotland, um, as I mentioned, it's a smaller country, so there's smaller the economies of scale of having fewer people to get through to get to the right person. So, there has always been an element that I can sort of phone or text the tourism minister. I mean, not recently because they've been quite busy, um, but. Um, there is an element of being able to get to the right people and uh, i think when the policy driven model it, it's embedded in scottish government already but it it needs like a lot of parts of, of industry at the moment it needs a bit of fuel running through it we need more conspicuous wins in order to to, to, to gather momentum and for other directors to say hey that was easy and it didn't cost 20 million pounds um but i think that the opportunity is to uh showcase scotland in various sectors renewable energies uh, medical 
And I think on, on the back of the COVID thing, we're so, like uh, in London at Excel, the SEC in Glasgow has been the Louisa Jordan Hospital, um, but also the fact that so many conferences had to cancel in Scotland because their delegate profile was medical. And I think there's a huge opportunity here in Scotland to um, look at the positive legacy, if, that, if there is such a thing, a positive legacy of, of COVID and the way that the business events community, including the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, many others, they use their expertise to help fight this. And we can't just let that drift away. It includes the hotels that have been accommodating homeless people. I mean, there's an awkward discussion to be had at some point. Um, but there must be some positive legacy. And the whole sustainability debate, um, a lot of the sustainability work has been done for the original sustainability debate by COVID. You know, the skies are empty, the Venice's waters are clear, all that lovely stuff. But what it has shown us is the, the fact that everything from a sustainability point of view, everything is interconnected. So, you know, then it's been mind boggling to, to be reminded. I mean, we're all smart people. We know it matters if somebody has a job on the other side of the world. We know it matters if, you know, for people to be able to pay for their childcare here, if they have a job, everything's connected, whether that job is working in a pub or a cinema or a, a pret or whatever. If it's not open and they're not earning, the knock-on effect is massive. And I think the job here for business events is to demonstrate that, A, we're at the forefront of dealing with it, but the wider thing of being part of the sustainable things of doing things differently, um, but the inherent human need to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, and that's that's critical. You know, all the communities work, the good works of getting communities together, uh, the number of, the interaction I've had with my own colleagues you know, has increased massively. You know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. You need to ask them. <laughs> but I never spent so much time speaking to them. And it's the same with our clients. That is a good thing. Yeah, you know, there's so many times I've had a video conference with somebody who normally it would be a phone call or just long emails. So there's good things coming out of it. The the whole work ethos, the, the whole communities thing. And we've been banging on for years about the good tourism that business events represent. And our favorite example is the, um, you know, the small conference for the Scottish Association of Marine Science that went into Oban, a little village come town on the west coast of Scotland. And at that, in attendance were two people from NASA. Uh, now that's, that's a massive deal in terms of showcasing your little corner of Scotland, which is normally full of tourists. Um, and there's, that's good. Uh, but this is a whole different level of visitor showcasing. If I was a local councillor from from the urban area, and that can be replicated all around Scotland. So we need to seize this and say, we can bring good tourism even to the overpopulated parts of Scotland, not overpopulated, those that were experiencing over tourism issues prior to COVID. There's another interesting discussion to be had sometime soon. Um, and working out that, okay, we, we don't want to go back. Some good things have come out of this. There's a lot of things we don't want to go back to, but how can business events be part of not just filling up with low spend people? And, you know, let's bring in the academics, let, let's showcase your area. So for Scotland, we've got the big cities, we've got all the little rural pockets with academic centers of excellence. St. Andrews and Fife, that's a rather favorite example. You have the golf, you've got a beautiful historic town yes. but throw into the mix a world-class university and you have the, the almost the perfect um business events destination and an incentive playground all in one go so yes um so th there's a lot we can do and also wide open spaces there's that sense that a bit like that scandinavian thing scotland isn't scandinavia but there is that visual of you know scotland has got unspoiled landscapes, the, the hills, the glens, the mountains, the lochs, the mystery. If you want to get away from people in wide open spaces, come to Scotland. And after 10 weeks of this, you know, I think people are desperate to get anywhere. Absolutely. Um, and we look forward to welcoming our English friends, our Welsh friends, all our friends from around the UK as soon as possible. I'm sure we'll be reciprocating. But certainly when the planes start landing, whether that's in the next few months or autumn or next year, we want to be ready and make sure it's the right kind of business event coming here.
Absolutely. And I'm sure that will be the case. It sounds like things are certainly on track despite all the challenges, Neil. Um, and, and thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, that is really insightful. I think we're, we'll, you know, we, we're coming to the end of our time together today, but I just wanted to, to really thank you. Um, there's some really great details, some great nuggets of information in there. Um, it's been a pleasure to have had you with us today. Um, thank you, as I say, for taking the time out to, for, for a few questions um, for You're IBTM welcome. Meets. And, uh, you know, I think really exciting times ahead. I look forward to seeing how that un un unravels as we go through. Um, and I will be word. one of those. Yeah. Pans, I think <laughs> you mean pan, pans out. <laughs> pans out, yes. Um, so that will be one of those. Um, I'll be one of those UK visitors, certainly looking to, oh, to get up to Scotland perfect. soon. So um, I, I think all that's left to say now is thank you again. Um, stay safe. And, yep. um, you know, we, we look forward to catching up, hopefully face to face very, very soon. Uh, sure, good luck with the, the next few weeks. And yeah, we'll, we'll speak very soon. Great. Well, thanks to IBT and thanks to you, Shane and uh, Fiona. And I think just from Scotland to all of you watching, you know, from me and my team, you know, we'll get through this. We'll get back together and uh, we're not completely sure what it will look like. But um, without, you know, diluting the, the gravity of what's happened, you know, people still go to football matches when they can watch it on TV. Um there's, there's no different to us. We'll find a way through this and we'll get back together and we'll all see each other again. Um, and I think there is a sense of the end in sight, but yes. I and my colleagues, we can't wait to get together with our extended business events family from around the world as soon as we can. So thanks Absolutely. again for the opportunity. Thank um, you, Neil. It's great to have had you. We'll speak to you soon. Take yep. care now. You're welcome. Bye. -bye. Bye.